Welcome back to the 6Ps podcast. Today's episode is going to be a read through of chapter four from The Longest Memory. Just before we get started, just a reminder that this video contains information about sexual assault and violence, which may be triggering to survivors. If affected, you can call 1-800-RESPECT, that's 1-800-737-732, to receive assistance for the National Sexual Assault Family and Domestic Violence Counselling Line. Let's look at a summary of this chapter. It's a really short chapter. Actually, it's only two pages, and it's from Cook's perspective. It is the first of her two chapters, and only two characters get more than one chapter. That is Cook and Lydia, who will meet in the next chapter. In this chapter, Cook describes the aftermath of Sanders Senior's rape and how Whitechapel saved her. She commends Whitechapel's strength, loyalty and dignity in dealing with Sanders Senior and expresses her love for Whitechapel. Make note that this chapter, which is again focused around the theme of love, occurs right after Sanders Senior's chapter and we'll get onto that juxtaposition a little bit later on. But when it comes to the structure of the text, Fred de has been very deliberate in placing Cook's chapter right after Sanders Senior's. In terms of the key themes, once again, we've got racism and discrimination as well as grief and suffering based on Cook's experiences with Sanders Senior. However, the majority of this chapter focuses on the theme of love and family and the significance of Whitechapel. Chapter four, Cook. After he laid his hands on me, I wanted to die. I planned to find a way to the river whose banks were swollen and hurl myself into its strong currents. Whitechapel saved me. The second time I had to tell someone or surely die. There was no one to tell but my husband. Whitechapel saved my life. A child, not his, a pure wife no longer pure, any other man would have thrown me away. He is no ordinary man. His master respects him. I see it whenever they meet. My Whitechapel got that hand of an overseer fined. Fined? He made him apologise. And to make sure it never reoccurred, he got him married. My Whitechapel did all that. To think at first I shunned his attentions. What did this old man want with me but to make me a widow at 25? I said, no, go away. I'd introduce you to my mother if I knew where she was. Anything and everything rude I could think of. But the more insults I hurled, the harder he tried. I wanted somebody young. Someone who could chase my children and catch them. Not this old man, who will not be able to pick them up. I was wrong. He can love. He proves he loves me every day. He treats my firstborn as his own. We agreed never to speak again on the subject of Mr. Sanders. Never. And he meant it. Not a word or jibe has slipped from him. I've seen him with that Sanders. My Whitechapel is twice the gentleman. The master is kind towards me for the simple reason that I am Whitechapel's wife and not the woman who was wronged. I know because before the marriage he did not say two words to me. Whitechapel is my life. I will bear him many sons, as many sons as he has daughters. There is no earthly way I can match his love. Every word he said to me during his visits to Mr. Sanders to see me have come true. He promised to defend my honour, to love me, to keep me by his side. Only death could divide us, he said. This I took to be idle talk, the sweetness of a man's tongue when he hungers for a woman. But not Whitechapel. How can a slave promise such things, I challenged. He said I should trust him. In another man's eyes, Sanders laying his hands on me would have been a sign of my ruin but not Whitechapel's. Another man would have seen my pregnancy with Sanders for seed as adequate cause to abandon me, not Whitechapel. I will bear him many sons. He will die contented. I will grow old with my sons alone and happy to have met my Whitechapel. So we've got a couple of key quotations from this very short chapter. We've got the first one, after he laid his hands on me, I wanted to die. Here we have the consequences of a traumatic experience and the grief with which Cook feels. It leads to extreme thoughts and feelings. 
And the second quote here is, I guess, about what can help. And it's love. It's integral in overcoming traumatic experiences. Cook writes, Whitechapel saved me. He's no ordinary man. My Whitechapel got that hand of an overseer fined. Fined. He made him apologise and to make sure it never reoccurred, he got him married. My Whitechapel did that. I also like the reason why it's quite a long quote is because of the personal pronouns. It's my Whitechapel to exacerbate and emphasise the pride and love that she feels for him. The next quote, he can love. He proves he loves me every day. Continuing this really optimistic tone of this chapter and the importance of love and family, once again, in overcoming traumatic experiences. Whitechapel is my life. There is no earthly way I can match his love. He promised to defend my honour, to love me. He said I should trust him. You know, those words love, trust, it's in direct contrast to the previous chapter with Sanders Senior. Here is someone driven by pure lust and sexual power. And we compare that to the emotional connection between Whitechapel and Cook and it's in stark contrast to emphasise the purity of their relationship. And the last quote is just the phrase, not Whitechapel, not Whitechapel, not Whitechapel. It's repeated a couple of times towards the end of this chapter. Once again, the repetition emphasises his decent and moral character, particularly in contrast, of course, with Sanders Senior, who she's sort of comparing him to, really. And once again, I'm thinking about the previous phrases that have been used to call those who are enslaved, you know, words like inferior and subhuman. Well, Whitechapel definitely acts in a really moral way here. He's showing himself to be the character of the highest character, pardon the pun. And just think about this society that's driven by Christian values and upholding Christian values. Well, have a look at Whitechapel's behaviour here. He embodies those classic Christian values of love, care and compassion for others. When thinking about connections to seven stages of grieving, once again, it might be a really short chapter, but I definitely think there's some places to go here. The first one, the importance of love and acceptance in overcoming grief, which Whitechapel provides to Cook. And you could compare that to perhaps scene 24, reconciliation in the seven stages of grieving. You know, the optimism, the hope, the love, the acceptance, the broad community support that's needed in order to overcome grief. The second point is a power of family and community. So here I've thought about Whitechapel support for Cook is reflected in the community support of the First Nations people in scene 15, which was the march in response to Daniel Vock's death. You could also think about Cook and the way she later passes this love on to her son, Chapel, and in his relationship with Lydia. And perhaps you can compare that to Nana's story in Seven Stages of Grieving and that generational love, the importance of family and passing that down through later generations. The last one I wanted to point you towards is about gender, which isn't something that is necessarily explicit in these texts, but I think it's really important to consider that women are targets of sexual abuse in both texts. We've got the invasion poem in Seven Stages of Grieving, and here obviously we've got Cook and the treatment of Cook. You know, women's fate is in the hands of men. You know, Cook says twice in another man's eyes, she says in another man's eyes, Sanders laying his hands on me would have been a sign of ruin. And she later on says, another man would have seen my pregnancy with Sanders forced seed as adequate cause to abandon me. You know, Sanders and his actions are not the fault of women here, not the fault of Cook here. Yet she's the one potentially who faces or who has the most to lose. It's, it's women and their fate is often in the hands of men. So please consider the role of gender and thinking about which characters you could connect them to in the seven stages of grieving. But again, there's so much more that you could compare, I'm sure. Uh, that's all for today, a nice short chapter and hope to see you for the next video very soon.